Well, praise the Lord, everyone. Uh, this is Pastor Shaw, pastor of the Garden of Peace Worship Center in the city of Corona, California. We have been hiatus for a few weeks, uh, illness, and then, of course, uh, last week, of course, we had our holiday, which was the Thanksgiving week. And uh, so now we're back, and we're thankful to be back. Amen. Glad to be back. Amen. Uh, teaching the Word of God. Our passion, our passion is to teach, amen, and preach God's Word uh, because, uh, number one, I need it, and then there are those that need it uh, as well. So we're just thankful to be back, thankful to be in the house of God, amen, thankful for God to be uh, the God that He is. And so we're going to go to the Word of the Lord. Uh, and as usual, we know we probably will not finish all of this, uh, but we are going to go to it. And uh, we're going to go to 1 Corinthians. And as it says, our topic is no revival without reformation. You know, and uh, we say that because wherever Christians meet these days, one word is sure to be heard, constantly repeated, and that is revival. We need a revival. You know, we need a revival again, you know, and, and uh, as the scripture said, revive us again in the midst of the years in wrath, Lord, remember mercy. But uh, you hear a lot about revival and uh, what uh, we're talking about tonight is that there can be no revival, uh, first of all, without reformation. In other words, you can't revive somebody if they're not willing to change, if they're not willing to make some changes. Amen. If they're not, you know, and today we have so many uh, things that uh, can get in the way uh, of us walking with God. So many things. I mean, uh, you know, just uh, from our jobs to, you know, our, our, our life, from, you know, from our homes, all of these things, many of these things can get in the way of us walking with God, you know, and, 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 uh, and it's because we allow them Hallelujah, to get in the way. I'm not saying they get in the way necessarily as we allow them. So let's go to 10th chapter uh, of the book of 1 Corinthians. We're going to start there and uh, we're going to read. And it says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock, and that rock that, and that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples, Lord have mercy to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither we should be idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Okay, uh, first thing I, you know, as I was reading, the first thing I noticed is that what the Apostle Paul is trying to say to us is that all three, of the three things he mentions, he said they were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink. In other words, they all had the same opportunity in God. They were given that opportunity. They were shared with that opportunity. You know, it's like many times people will ask, you know, well, you know, uh, how do you know who's going to hell? I don't, you know, but I know if you do like these people, and that is that you ruin your opportunity, amen, to walk with God. Because look what he says. He says, and they were all baptized under Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat. They ate the same spiritual meat as everybody else, okay? They did all drink the same spiritual drink. 
okay? And for they drank of that spirit, spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Christ gave them what they needed. Hallelujah. Bless his name. God, Christ gave them the sustenance that they needed to be saved, to walk with him. God, that's why he says, uh, when he quotes the Lord's Prayer, as we call it, you know, we know really the Lord's Prayer is, of course, in the, in the book of St. John, chapter 17. But his model prayer, he says, give us this day our daily bread. That's important because daily I'm fed by God. Now with the Holy Spirit on the inside, I'm fed by God and I walk with God daily. I'm not only walking with God on Sunday or as some people, Saturday. I'm not only doing that. I'm walking with God every day. And every day he feeds me and he gives me drink, that spiritual drink that comes from the rock. Hallelujah. Remember Jesus said the stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. And this spake he of himself. So he was called the rock. The rock of Israel, hallelujah. Many times in the Psalms, uh, David calls him the rock, hallelujah. And, and of course, that's what he is. He is a rock, hallelujah. Remember, Jesus has many, many different representatives, many different attributes that he is, you know. He is our peace. He is, amen, our provider. He is all of these things. He is there. He is present with us. He is all of these things. He's our shepherd, you know. So he is our rock, hallelujah. And that same spiritual rock. Now, here's the difference, is that it said that the, the rock followed them, that rock was Christ, but with many of them, God was not well pleased. God was not pleased with them. Why? And the Apostle Paul explains it. He says, for they, but with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, these things were our examples. These are examples. We daily eat of the Lord's table. Hallelujah. And I'm not talking about communion. I'm talking about reading of his word. I don't care if you have a daily word. I don't care if you have, uh, you know, there's all kind of different uh, uh, ways you can read the word. You know, you have these different books and things that we have that talk about the word, all kind of different ways. But we eat it daily. Even if it's just a few scriptures that you think about, that you read uh, today and, you know, you meditate on that all day. But we eat of that spiritual rock, hallelujah. We drink of that spiritual rock on a daily, hallelujah, hallelujah. And each day, what it does, it feeds the spirit man. See, because what happens is a lot of times, just like with them, amen, we feed the natural man. And I'm not talking about food right now. I'm talking about what, like he says here. He says, now these things were for our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. He said, neither be ye idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink and the rose up to play. Now, if you know where that's located, that is located in the book. Uh, uh, I believe it's in the book. I just read it. <laughs> Exodus, book of Exodus. And what happened was this is at the time that Moses was up in the mount and they, the people came to uh, Aaron and said, now we don't know whether this joke is coming back or not. You know, he'd been up there for a long time and Moses was up there. Uh, he was up there for 40 days and they said, we don't know whether he's coming back or not. So what we need you to do is make us a God of gold. And you know what? I was reading that today and there was no hesitation by Aaron. I read that and I looked at that and, you know, I mean, no hesitation. Aaron told them to take off their earrings, take off the different jewels that they had. And the Bible said he fashioned that calf. He, there was no hesitation. So what did that tell me? That tell me and told me that he also was wondering about Moses up in the mount. Just like the people came to him and said, we don't know whether he's coming back down or not. He must have had the same thoughts because he did not hesitate. Read it. Read it. Read that scripture. And I'm trying to think of what chapter. I think it was because uh, I looked it up before I even uh, did this. And, and, and I, I don't remember what, what chapter that it was. Uh, but 
It's in the book of Exodus. And I read it, and then I end up changing my scripture to 1 Corinthians, where it talks about it. I was going to talk on that scripture, but now I'm talking about it. But I, I want you to look at that. If you look at, you know, search. Remember what Jesus said, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they testify of me. So sometimes we make it too easy. So I'm going to have you search the scriptures. Look it up. If you have a, con uh, you know, a concordance or whatever type of Bible, look it up. Read it for yourself, and you will see that they told Aaron, said, look, Moses, we don't know if he's coming back. He's been up there a long time. And so, you know, uh, you've seen the Ten Commandments. So uh, when, when God told Moses, said, the people have corrupted themselves, you know, and he said, get thee down. Well, that's what he said. He told them to get down. Because the people, what they did, they rose up to play. Just like he says here, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. But they lusted after evil because they lusted after idols. He said, neither be ye idolaters as were some of them as it is written. The people uh, sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. What I'm saying to you is that for revival to come, we have to change. OK, somebody coming through and preaching a good word and then nobody changes, you know, nobody wants to be better. Nobody wants to be holy. Nobody wants to be righteous before God. That's the problem. And so for a real revival to come, people have to change because that's where the power comes. You know, when we change, hallelujah, when we let the Holy Ghost move and walk in us and have his free course, that's where the power of God, and that's what people are looking for. The people are looking for the power, the true worshipers of God. They are looking for the power of God in somebody. Hallelujah. Somebody that can give them peace. Somebody, last night I was talking with somebody, uh, uh, you know, and, and I mean, they were distraught and everything, going through a lot of things in their mind and everything. See, you have to have power, amen, to be able to speak peace and to pray with them and have, you know, it's not enough, amen. To say, well, you know, I'm going to pray for you. In fact, that's what they told me. They said, you know, I want to tell you what you need to pray for. And I was glad because I didn't have to throw a prayer that, you know, and hope I hit something. You know, I'm, I was going to be on target because they gave me what to pray for. Hallelujah. And so I prayed for exactly what they gave me. Hallelujah. But the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart. Hallelujah will keep you. And that's what it's all about. If we want revival in the land, there has to be a reformation. There has to be a change. Hallelujah. Like in the days of Azusa Street back in 1906, you know, there was people that wanted different. They want they were tired of tired of the status quo. They were tired of the same old thing. They were tired of just going to church Sunday after Sunday and you know, and nothing new happening and no. I mean, they wanted the power of God. So they begin to call on God, but they were willing to change. They were willing to accept. They were willing to walk with God. They were willing to lead a holy life. Hallelujah. Today, we don't know the difference between the church and the world. You know, now I'm speaking to you. I'm a pastor, you know, but I know that so many things have gotten convoluted and so many things have gotten mixed up, you know, where you go to the church and there's no difference. You know, uh, I mean, <laughs> oh, God, people doing the same thing in the church, you know, people doing all kind of stuff in the church that shouldn't be going on. But we, as the people of God, we have to stand up for righteousness, stand up for holiness. Hallelujah. We got to walk with God. Now, I know some of these things are subjective. They're subjective, what people do in their churches. Some of these are subjective. Some of those, we can't get a scripture and say, no, brother, don't do that. Or no, sister, sister, pastor, don't allow this in your church. And I'm not here to nitpick in any way. What I'm saying is let's walk with God. 
Hallelujah. You talking about I want revival. That means I need to reform. I need to be have an open mind to what thus saith the Spirit of God. What is God saying to me? Let's move on. Remember he said, let's go over to the other side. Hallelujah. There was power to be expressed on the other side when he cast out demons out of the Gadarene uh, man. You know, there was something on the other side that these people, you know, sometimes you got to go to the other side because what's over here is not enough. That's why he says in Ephesians, be ye filled. They already had the Holy Ghost. They already had been filled with the Holy Ghost as far as, you know, the initial evidence of speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave us. They already had that. But he said, be ye filled with the Spirit. Hallelujah. That means you walk in the Spirit. You talk in the Spirit. You live in the Spirit. Hallelujah. You have a mind. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, though being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made of himself no reputation. Hallelujah. But took upon him the form of a servant. See, we need more servants. People that want to serve God, not people that want to be important, want to serve God, want to walk with God. Hallelujah. Ha. Ah, you know what I learned long time ago, that the closer I get God, the humbler I become. People that are all arrogant and everything, they're not close. Hallelujah. Because God humbles you. The closer you get to him, the more you know it's not you. An enemy would have swallowed me up. The closer you get to God, the more your prayer life is, the more, amen, that you read in your word, the more established you get in the present truth. You learn and you become, you know, knowledgeable of the fact that if it was not the Lord who guides me, the Lord who saves me, the Lord who leads me, I would be nothing. I would be, so I can't brag on me. If I'm going to boast, I heard him say, boast in the Lord. I, I like that. I like that. I, I like that scripture, uh, 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 you know, where he says, if you want to boast, you boast in the Lord. Uh, and I'm looking for that right now because I know, you know, that I want to boast, but I want to boast in God. I don't have anything to boast of uh, about myself. But I do have something to boast of about my God because he is worthy. Hallelujah. Amen. I know it's in, in Corinthians and uh, I'm looking for it and I, I'll, I'll find it. Hallelujah. Of course, I know it's in Jeremiah as well. And, uh, you know, but I want to talk about boasting in the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm not anything. I can't do it without God. Hallelujah. I can't walk with God without him walking with me. You know, I can't do anything without the Lord. The Lord, hallelujah, is the one that doeth, you know, the works, as, as Paul said in one place. It is he that doeth the works. Well, actually, Jesus said that when he was talking about the Father. You know, he said he doeth the works. Hallelujah. The works that I do. Hallelujah. Of course, it is he that does it in me. So, amen, amen, and amen. But I'm saying is that, uh, yes, here it is. It's actually in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, amen, and it says, he, but he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. And that's what it really what it's all about. Hallelujah. Is who does the Lord commend? Not who do I say I am, who, you know, not who do I try to be, want to be, you know, uh, uh, try to be like somebody else I saw or anything like that, but whom the Lord commendeth. Hallelujah. That's what's important. Does God put his stamp on me? Remember the, the sons of Sceva, <coughs> the seven sons <coughs> that tried to cast out the devil by the name of Jesus, whom Paul knew. The devil said, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. But who are you? That means they had knowledge of them because God commended them. Hallelujah. God commended Paul. God commended Jesus. Hallelujah. So the sons of Sceva were not commended. 
They were not anointed by God. They were not chosen by God. They were just using his name. But you can't do that. You have to have a life. See, when God steps on the inside, he gives you everything you need. He gives you righteousness. Because your righteousness, my righteousness, is as filthy rags. Hallelujah. My righteousness is no good. Your righteousness is no good. That's why, again, I can't brag about who I am. Can't brag about what I've done. And, you know, I've done this for the Lord. I've done that. Honey, if I didn't have the Holy Ghost, if I didn't have the power of God, if I, I didn't have the mind of Christ, I wouldn't be able to do anything. You know, it's just like we have to understand, just like Jesus constantly gave the glory to God, the Father, as he gave that glory to him. My and I work, you know, as he would say, we have to do the same thing. We know that God is not us. Things. Hallelujah. He changes things in your life. He makes you righteous. I love it that because of my faith, by faith, you know, he said, Abraham, amen. Abraham uh, uh, believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. When you believe God, it's accounted unto you for righteousness. When your faith, amen, touches God, it's accounted unto you for righteousness. I'm not righteous enough, but God's righteousness is put in me by the Holy Spirit. His love, look at, let's look at the fifth chapter, amen, of uh, uh, Galatians. You know where I'm going. Fifth chapter of Galatians. I'm going to the fruit of the Spirit. Going to the fruit of the Spirit. Hallelujah. Fifth chapter of Galatians. Here's what he says. He says. Verse number 22. But. Of course he gives you all the bad things. He says. And, and I'll show you the contrast. He says, now the works of the flesh are manifest, this is verse 19. He said, which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Remember the scripture we just read where he says... Uh, God was not pleased with them, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, these things were our examples. He's saying it again. For they which do such things, he said, I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past. What he says is that they which do such things. Now, do such things. Practice. Practice things. See, Practice such things. Live like such things. Not you made a mistake. Not you fail one time. But you are a practicer of these things. You live in these things. He said, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. It's amazing that gentleness is a fruit of the spirit. And a lot of people are so mean. A lot of people of God are so judgmental, so mean. So, you know, like they got it all together. Nobody else has anything together. People sometimes are living on a thread, a thread of righteousness, a thread of holiness, a thread. Sometimes people are down, despondent. People are depressed and they're on a thread. And then we have the nerve who are also receiving the grace of God. And we have the nerve to come like we have done something and come at them like, you know, you struggling. Why? Well, some people struggle. Some people do. Part of life. But he says gentleness. Look at what he says in verse in chapter six. He says uh, brethren, brethren, verse one, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual restore, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. We talked about gentleness in the spirit of meekness. 
You know, what happened to that? What I'm, I'm talking about, people talking about revival and people won't reform. People don't, don't, don't uh, uh, allow the Holy Spirit to use them in their daily life, to be walking up and down in them, to let the fruit of God, the fruit of the Spirit operate in them. And then we want revival, but we don't want to change. We should, the fruit of the Spirit, Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness. He just said, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual. That what, so what that tells me is the problem with a lot of saints is we're not spiritual. We're carnal. That's why we come to people in such arrogant ways. That's why we come to people and instead of encouraging them, we're judging them and tearing them down because we are not spiritual. I didn't say it. The book said it. I told, I used to tell people, I said, I remember uh, I had been out of church for a while. I had been sick. I had, had been sick for a while. I had been really sick. And saints were coming to visit me and everything like that. And it took me years to come back to church. When I came back, I mean, I didn't backslide or nothing. I'm saying I was out ill. But when I came back to church, a brother walked up to me and his words to me were, give an account of yourself. And I'm telling you, it took everything in my Holy Ghost body to not grab him. He had never been to my house. He had never called me. He had never asked, was I okay? None of those things. And then the first thing you say to me is give an account of yourself. That is not the spirit of meekness. I wasn't overtaken in a fault. But, I mean, you should have been gentle with me. You should have. And I learned from that. And when I see people today that haven't been there for a while, mm -hmm. oh, I'm so glad to see you. It's so good to see you again. I never in my life will say, give an account of yourself. Where you been? I don't say that, you know, because it's wrong. It's not right. We're supposed to be gentle. Talking about revival, no revival without reformation. If we want revival, we have to want to change. We have to want to be like Christ. That's when revival takes course. That's when God can use us. Mm. So he says meekness, temperance. Of course, temperance is self-control. 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 Against such there is no law. There's no law against any of that. You can't. Nobody will take you to jail for loving people. Nobody will take you jail, to jail for having joy. Nobody will take you to jail for having peace in your life. You know, against such there is no law. There's no law against peace. There's no law against you being meek. Hallelujah. There's no law against any of that. That's why there is no law. He said, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. So that's a part of it. Crucifying the flesh. Kill. Remember what the scripture says in Colossians? I believe it's Colossians 3. He said, if ye therefore be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Then he tells us to mortify the deeds of the flesh. I'm not going to just say that. I'm going to turn to it. Let's turn to Colossians. I, I forget sometimes. I like, if you're going to teach, I like to teach and people can go to the Bible themselves. You don't have to listen to me. I'm going to take you to the word of God. You, might, uh, you can go to the word of God yourself. He says, chapter three of Colossians, he said, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, but not on things of the earth. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye appear appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concuspience, and con covetousness, which is idolatry. Now, I, I just went through some, some things, and I am going to go into a different, I'm going to go 
to a different translation. So I want to do that because I like to do that. I like to do that because I think it's important, you know, that you uh, get it sometimes, uh, you know, exactly what those words, because again, 1611, this Bible was translated in 1611 with the these and thous, and I know a lot of people like that, and uh, I don't have no problem with you liking it, you know, but sometimes you need, uh, you know, a more up-to-date, ah, glory, okay, I'm not going to read it all, I'm going to go to the part where it says mortify, you know, uh, I want to go to that part, let's see, what chap what verse is that, that verse is five, verse number five. Here's what he says for verse number five. He says, so put to death and deprive the power of evil longings of your earthly body, which it's sensual, self-centered instincts, immorality, impurity, because it replaces your devotion to God. Mm, isn't that something? He says, because of these sinful things, the divine wrath of God is coming on the sons or daughters of disobedience. Those who fail to listen and who routinely, obstinately disregard God's precepts. See, that's one thing that's important. Uh, going back, I want to go back to uh, uh, Galatians chapter 5. And I want to I read this again. Uh, remember, we were reading about the fruit of the Spirit, chapter 5. I want to read it in the Amplified because I want you to get this. Here's what he says. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit, the result of his present within, presence within us, is love, unselfish concern for others. It is a love that God puts on the inside of us. Hallelujah. And gives us an unselfish concern for others. Mm, that's powerful. He says... Uh, it is it is joy. That's inner. Hallelujah. Peace. Patience. Not ability to wait, but how we act while we're waiting. Kindness. Goodness. Faithfulness. Gentle. See, that word faith. Most people think that's the same word because the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit both have the word faith. But the word faith in the fifth chapter of Galatians is the word for faithfulness. That is a fruit of the Spirit, faithfulness. And that, again, is another fruit that people have forgot all about. People are faithful to everything but the Lord. I, should, I, I shouldn't have to say that again. But people are faithful to everything but the Lord. People are faithful to the Lakers. I know a lot of y'all. You know, I see my cousin on here. I know she may be an Orlando Magic fan. I don't know. But people are faithful to basketball, football, college sports, high school sports, and things like that, and not faithful to God. Some people are not even faithful to their own families. And God puts a family together. God puts families together. He took Adam. And he brought, listen what the scripture says in the King James. It says, and God brought the woman to Adam. See, he created families. Hallelujah. The family unit. God created that. So, number one, you can't be the save all to everybody else and not your family. Mm, my God. And But you also cannot be so wrapped up. In your family, in your plans, in your life, in everything is your, 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 that you don't have any time for the Lord. Mm. Here's what he says. So that word faith is pistis in the Greek, in the book, it, where it talks about gifts of the spirit. That's talking about something else. The word here is faithfulness, gentleness. Self-control, that's what we said temperance was, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have crucified the sinful nature together with its passions and appetites. Now, I want to go uh, to the next chapter where we were talking about again. Now, here's what he says, amplified. Uh, he says, brothers, if anyone is caught up in any sin, who are who, those of you who are spiritual, that is, 
You are responsive to the guidance of the Spirit. What we were just saying about the fruit of the Spirit. If you're not spiritual, if you're not under the control of the Holy Spirit, if you're not being led by the Spirit, you need to leave people alone. Because he says, you which are spiritual, and spiritual here is defined as, that is, you who are responsive to the guidance of the Spirit, are to restore such a person in the spirit of gentleness. Now, remember, the Bible here in the, in the King James says meekness, but here we go back to that word gentleness. He said, not with the sense of superiority, oh God. Or self-righteousness. Not coming to people telling them, you know, girl, that never happened to me. You know, I love the Lord. You know, or not coming with a superiority complex. You know, not coming to people and you lording over them. And you know, yeah, you know, that could never happen to me. Because I love, I mean, mm -mm. he says, you know, not with a sense of superiority or self-righteousness. Because all of our righteousness comes from God. you not righteous anyway. I'm not righteous. All my righteousness, Isaiah says, is filthy rags. I am righteous because God is in me. I'm righteous because the Lord has chose to abide in this temple. That's the only reason. Then he says, uh, keeping a watchful eye on yourself so that you are not tempted as well. Carry one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the requirements of the law of Christ. That is, the law of Christian love. Okay, so if we want revival, go back to revival, then we have to have Christian love for one another. We want revival Let's have a revival of love. Let's start treating each other right. Let's start, let the, ha, I remember that song, I went to Oral Roberts University. I'd never heard this song in my life. I went there because I wanted to go to school there. Uh, and when I went there, I mean, it blew my mind. The place was awesome. The place was awesome. I mean, just a. shifts and prayer was always going on. I'm sure they're doing the same today, but they had shifts where they would pray and then that next shift would come in and they would pray and take over. I don't remember how long they prayed, but it was prayer going on in that tower all the time. But when I was there, I met people from Florida. I had, I'd never met a person from Florida. You know, I met people from all over the country that wanted to go there. And so we went there and we bumped. I bumped together with three other guys, with four of us in a room. And I remember sitting on the floor on that Saturday evening. We were sitting on the floor and a guy got his guitar and he began to play. And he began to play a song I had never heard at that time. And the song was, And They Will Know We Are Christians by our love. And I mean, I was blown away by it. I never heard it, you know, in my life, but he was strumming, strumming, <laughs> strumming. <laughs> he was stringing his, his guitar and, he, and they'll know we are Christian. By yes, they'll know we are Christian by our love. And I was like, and that's it. A revival of love, a revival, hallelujah. Well, let's treat people, amen, better than they should be treated. And it doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter if they're the president or it doesn't matter if they're somebody on skid row. It doesn't matter if they're somebody who's homeless. None of that matters. Let's treat people with the love of God. Hallelujah. Because you know what? I learned a long time ago that people, that God, whatever you do for God will be multiplied back to you. And if you show love, love's coming back. If you show, amen, if you help people, if you, uh, uh, you know, are kind to people, that's coming back to you. Hallelujah. It's coming back to you because that's the way God, he said, give and I'll give it back to you. Press down, shaking together, running over, good measure, shall men give unto your bosom. 
Hallelujah. That's that song we sing, you know, when we have our forgive and I give it back to you. Press down, you know. I'm not going to keep singing. But uh, those, <laughs> my wife looking at me funny. That's all right. Hallelujah. Uh, you know, that show you right there that I come from Bethany. Because Bishop McMurray would break out in the song. Of course, I can't sing like him. But he'd break out in the song right in the middle of the message. You know, hallelujah. Amen. So, uh, but they'll know we are Christians by our love. And we need to show love. If we give, give. He said, give, and I'll give it back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. Give. Hallelujah. The reason a lot of us don't receive anything is because we don't give anything. We don't give of our time. We don't give of ourselves. You know, we got our own life. You know, people, I ain't going, you know, down to that church. I'm not doing this. I'm not. Well, you're going to stay in your situation then. Because you got to reach out. If that woman with the issue of blood had not reached out and said, look, Jesus is coming. This is my shot. If she had sat back there and said, well, hey, it's a lot of people out there. Man, there's people all over the place. I'm not going out there. Then she would have never got healed. If those people that brought that man and let him down in the house through the roof didn't have that tenacity, that man would have never been healed. His friends had the tenacity and the belief that if they got him to Jesus, he would be healed. But today, a lot of times, people are not that bodacious. They're not that tena tenacious. You know, it's oh me, oh my, when it comes to God. Now, everything else, we're tenacious. We're tenacious with our job. You know, we're trying to, you know, move on up the ladder. We're trying to be a supervisor. We're trying to, you know, move up to the next rank and everything like that. You know, but when it comes to God, we're satisfied, you know. If I come on Sunday, amen. If I don't make it on Sunday, well, you know, I didn't make it, you know. And, uh, and, and it shouldn't be so. It shouldn't be so. There should be a compel. I love the scripture, uh, I believe. And if I can't find it, I can't find it. But I believe uh, it is in 2 Corinthians. I'm going to look at chapter 8. Uh, it might be in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, but uh, it, you know what? And I think it is in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. But I, 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 it's something that Paul says that really uh, got to me. Let's see what he says. Uh, okay, chapter 8. Okay, I'm on the wrong chapter because it would help to have on some glasses, which I have on. And uh, let's see. Chapter 8, I, I like, it, it's a scripture where he says, Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. In other words, he said, because necessity is laid upon me. When God calls you, you have to do what God... It's a compelling within you. Hallelujah. It's something in you that moves you. Hallelujah. To do what God has called you to do. Hmm. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Uh, okay, yeah, here's what he says. He says, for, it's actually chapter 9, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He says, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. See, you got to have a, a, a conviction. I remember as a young person, and uh, my friend was on here, Sister Jerry. If she's still on here, I don't know. But uh, she knows. But back in the day when we were in the hour of power, Pastor Horn and myself, you know, we talked about having conviction, you know, having a compelling uh, to do the will of God. I mean, we didn't care. We went to church Monday through Sunday. You know, today, if you have uh, two services, people are like, oh, I'm tired. You know, I mean, we went Monday, three services. 
You had morning service. You had noon, 11 o'clock service. You had 6 o'clock service. You had Monday prayer band. You had Tuesday deliverance service. You had Wednesday Bible class. You had Thursday brotherhood, missionaries. You had Friday young people. You had Saturday where a lot of times we had breakfasts and things like that. And sometimes as a junior deacon, we would uh, uh, paint the church and do all kind of things, clean up. And then Sunday, it started all over again. But you didn't do it grudgingly. It's like, you know, like Paul said right here. He said, for though I preach the gospel and have nothing to glory of, for necessity. It was God that put a burden. That was the word I was looking for. The burden. We used to talk about the burden of the Lord. God puts it in you that you want to. You know, it's like the people used to come to me when I first got saved. I was in high school, and they would come to me and say, well, man, you know, you know, people that had went to church. I was not a person that went to church before I got saved, but these people went to church, and they were like, well, man, you know, you got to stop this. You can't smoke. You can't get high. You can't do all these things. And, you know, and I said, brother, you don't understand. I don't want to do those things. It's not a thing of, you know, uh, I can't. I can do it like you do, but I don't want to do that. I want to please God. See, that's the difference. I want to please God. And that's the the burden of the Lord that is on us. We want revival. There has to be a burden for the Lord's will, the Lord's work, living for the Lord, souls of men and women. Where is the compassion today? that we should have for souls. We walk by people. We see people in need. All of our churches, mine included, we should always have a a, a packed house. I'm saying this. I don't, but I'm saying this because there's people everywhere in need. People everywhere that need a word. Now, there's reasons we don't. They might not have a bus. They may not have transportation. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons. Some of them are excuses, but there's all kinds of reasons. But one of the main reasons, I believe God. If God has, I mean, if you have compassion on people, you'll find a way to get them to the house of God. Is not the word precious? Is it precious to you? How much more would the word be precious to somebody that doesn't know him? Somebody that doesn't have a relationship with God. If the word is precious to you, it's even more so precious to someone that doesn't know God. Our compassion, our burning, it's not there like it used to be. We've gotten, you know, I'm going to read this scripture. I'm going to read this scripture. Uh... Uh, and I'm going to find it right quick. And I know it's in the Old Testament, but I I, I, I want to find it right quick. And I, it might be in Amos. Let me look right quick. Yes, it is. It's in Amos chapter number 6 and verse number 1. And it says this. It says, Woe to them that are at ease in Zion. And trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations, to whom the house of Israel came. Now, I know all the rest of that because he's dealing with Israel. The prophet is saying to them that they're trusting in things that will not deliver them. They're trusting in riches. They're trusting in, you know, the armies uh, of Samaria and Omri, who was the king at that time. They're trusting in him because he had a certain kind of army. And God's saying, don't put your trust in these things. Put your trust in me. But the thing he says here is, woe to them who are evil. And that is what has happened with a lot of our church people, a lot of our saints of God, is we are at ease in Zion. As long as I can go hear my song, as long as I can go hear my preacher, as long as I can hear him on TV or on the radio or, or you know, or on streaming live and all those kind of things, I don't need to get up out of my bed. I don't need to put on clothes. I don't need to smell good and all that. You know, put on a nice dress, put on a nice suit or whatever, and go down to the house of God because I'm having it right here. 
But the Bible says, woe to them that are at ease in Zion. You so relaxed. Have you ever thought that somebody else needs to be saved? Have you ever thought that somebody else needs to hear a word from God? Have you ever thought that there's more than just you in this world? You know, while you're caught up, he says, whoa, we are at ease in Zion. You know, I go to 9 o'clock service. I go to 11. You know, we have all these cliches, all these things that we do, and we don't have the freedom to allow God to use us. Hallelujah. People, you know, people want to go to 11 o'clock service. Well, I go to 9 o'clock. I don't go to 11. So I can't help you. I can't bring you. I mean, we have to learn how you move your schedule for souls. <laughs> oh, my time is about up. Amen. I got five minutes. And, uh, you know, I'm glad, like I say, we're back. You know, we've been gone a few weeks due to illness one week. And also, and then, of course, last week, you know, we know that most people are preparing food and things like that. So we were off the air. But thank God we're back on Facebook Live. We're here every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Amen. We have our prayer line on Thursday nights. Uh, at 7 o'clock, 7 to 7.30. If you have prayer requests, we pray for you. Uh, we, I'm telling you, uh, God answers prayer. We have seen people healed, delivered. We've seen people that were uh, told that they had cancer, fourth stage, fifth stage, whatever it is, you know, that they would die in a couple of months and things like that. And people, you know, years later are still alive. The cancer is gone. We have prayed with people. I mean, we've prayed for people that were going to commit suicide. God has touched them, healed them, saved them. I mean, there is nothing that prayer can't do. It's all about ministering to people, the hurts, the needs of people, what people are hurting from. You know, there's a lot of mental illness, mental health issues these days, but I'm telling you, there is a God that gives peace. He said that surpasses all understanding. Hallelujah. He said it will guard your heart and your mind. Hallelujah. He gives you a peace, a peace. Amen. You still may have to go to the therapist, but you'll have peace. You still may, amen, have to make your appointments and things like that, but you'll have peace. Hallelujah. There's a God that can bring you out of depression. Hallelujah. He can bring you out. I'm not saying you'll never have to see a therapist or anything like that, but I'm saying there's a God that can bring you out. And if you trust him, hallelujah. He'll take you through. He'll be with you. So bless you in the name of Jesus. Uh, we, as we said, uh, I don't. I see that uh, Sister Shaw is not on. So I will tell you that our uh, line is six zero five. Uh, was, <laughs> I almost lost it. Six zero five four seven five two zero nine zero is our prayer line number. I'm gonna say that again. It is six zero five. Four seven five two zero nine zero, and the access code, of course, is one four five three seven six nine. So you can always look at this again. Uh, it's on our our page, my page, and uh, you can get that number. Amen. And we have prayer every Thursday at seven o'clock, and we'll pray for you. We have a, a eight eight hundred number eight six six. 617-8883. You can call that number. Leave your prayer request. We will pray for you. Amen. God bless you. May heaven smile on you. May God richly bless you is my prayer. Hallelujah. And I pray that we see you on next week at this same time, which is 7 o'clock. God bless you. <laughs>